Teens Lead Podcast. I'm your host, Amy Singleton, and as a child of the 80s, I'd love to say queens rule, but they don't. Queens lead. Being a queen means you are worthy to be a leader of people. The guests on our show do exactly that. They are leading the way in their businesses, families, and communities. They're taking their rightful place in the spotlight, leading and inspiring the developing queens in all of us. Welcome to the Queen's Lead Podcast. Welcome to the Queen's Lead Podcast. I'm your host, Amy Singleton, and today we are so excited to welcome Wendy Foreman from Oklahoma City. She is a realtor, a mother, a wife. Uh, She has had multiple philanthropic efforts through foster care and building homes. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. (laughs) We're excited to talk to you today. So tell the guests a little bit about who Wendy is in business and personally. So I, we've been business in Norman for a long time. I think we're third and fourth generation realtors. Um, as far as business goes, I am a lot of all business and a, a little of personal. I think we all kind of struggle with that as women, um, especially when you're a business owner, you know what I mean? Um, take on a lot. And um, so when, especially when you're in business with your family. so. I have two almost nearly grown children at this point, and I have raised my babies around real estate, and one of them has joined us in real estate. And of course, I'm in business with my husband too, which is always exciting, and my in-laws and other family members. So that's, it's like, a, um, these are my monkeys and these are my, this is my circus type of thing over here, pretty much. <laughs> and you've been running that circus, you said, for 23 20, years. Yeah. 23 years in realty. Yep. And How? Yeah. What got you started in that? So interestingly enough, my husband had started the year before I. And of course, we were having little people at the time. And he was struggling. And I looked at him and I'm like, okay, I can make this happen. I need you to step back. So he did and he let me take the lead role. And I think it's always interesting and important to understand where people have um, strengths and weaknesses across all areas of business and life. And so he did, he just stepped back and he let me take the reins and I took over running the shit show for lack of a better. (laughs) So, you know, I think that there is, so early on, and I mean, we were in our twenties and we didn't know what we didn't know. So I jumped full on in because I'm one of those people that will jump in and figure out how to fly on the way down. I don't really care how I'm going to get there. I'll get there. I'm not worried about how I'm going to get there. I just jump in and if I fail, it's no big deal because I've always understood that failure is part of the actual success process. And if you fail, 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 and then you succeed, the faster you fail, the quicker you're going to get there. Oh, that is such gold. And you say it so comfortably and I now understand it, but man, it took a long time. I definitely didn't know that in my twenties. I think it, I think I was already doing it when I had a mentor come into our office and take over the lead role in our office. He wanted to coach me. And I said, dude, I'm just not coachable. Like (laughs) <laughs> give me a damn break. I'm doing the thing. You don't need to tell me how to do the thing. Cause I already know I'm doing the thing. And he threw this book at me and said, fine, read this. And it was this book called go for no, which, you know, I was not trained technically in the sales type of business. And I always felt like our stuff was more of a customer service type of industry anyway, but reading that book really, and it was a very quick read. It's, you know, not very long. So something I read over a weekend. And I went, wow. And that's really kind of stuck with me, the whole part of the failure process. Mm -hmm. Go for the no. But I don't think that um, business owners necessarily, I think people, and there's so many things that kind of go along with the real estate model of being independently employed anyway. But, you know, there's all these business people out there and they may have talents in certain areas, but do they really know how to run a business? And 
that's where I've seen the most people fail. And it breaks my heart sometimes because they're so talented at what they do or the product that they have is such a unique proposition or they should be succeeding. And you're like, why are you failing? And I just, it, if I was passionate about anything, it would be seeing more women lead and more women, which is why it's interesting coming in your podcast and more women do do the thing that they're really, really good at or not have the fear of stepping into that role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely sounds like this business needed your leadership from the very beginning. And I think I recognize it. And luckily I had a partner that was willing to say, yeah, oh, yeah go for it. You know what I mean? And I, it, but I think that there's a lot of that that happens in for business owners. Definitely. Across the board. Men so when you started out, it was just you and your husband? It was, yeah. And now what does your team look like today? So typically we'll have an admin at this very second. I don't, but there's three licensed realtors. And then we have a bigger group of realtors that we brought into our company that I kind of coach and kind of keep up with and help and mentor along the way too, because we have a pretty formal mentoring process that we do. That's so important to, to build that team in the way that, that your leadership directs and to do it your way. I understand there are something like 7,000 realtors in our metro area. Probably. That's probably pretty close to accurate. Um, I know that it's high, but it's starting to drop off at this point. You yeah. Know, the, the market is pretty tough right now. So you know, I've kind of seen the ups and downs. And it's kind of funny because I am so head down, not paying attention, not listening to haters, not listening to what the news says, not listening to, that I remember going through, our downturn started here, probably in 2009, the end of 2009, I think it was October of 2009, the phone stopped ringing. And I was like, that's weird. So I get, I get to the end of probably 2010 and I look at the numbers and I'm like, oh damn, I've had a whole full-time employee this whole time and I barely made six figures. That didn't feel very good, but I guess we lived. So, yeah. you know, I mean, there's, there's weird times uh, during history. I guess I'm just one of those that I don't, I'm not really going to be veered off the process by anything that's going on one way or the other. So I don't worry about what's going on with the economy or anything else. I just keep my head down, keep going. That speaks volumes to to understanding that we all have an infinite purpose, right? Like all of these finite projects are coming and going, we're selling houses, we're selling businesses, we're bringing on team members, this and that, but you have an infinite purpose out in front of you. What would you say that that is? What are you serving in your life? I, I would have to say first and foremost, it's been my family. I you know every decision that I, that I make for us rotates around what it, it, and even expand, expanded family and somehow in my husband's family anyway I've adopted this kind of godmother role which is weird <laughs> and I didn't like intend to take it on but there's my 88 my, or 88 year old mother-in-law over here saying you better do what she said do anything she tells you to do <laughs> how did I get put in that role but okay by being a, a leader, by being the one that people look to for that direction. Yeah, it's weird, but somehow that's happened. But it's, you know, it's interesting when it's, I think it's about strength too. And putting, it, I think even as a young person, I was already telling them what to do, which is weird to think that people have personalities like that, that I'm that bossy. You know, the things that, that, uh, did you ever, did you ever look at your kind of bossiness, um, uh, when you were younger as a detriment? See, and I don't think I had it necessarily as a young person. I was one of those young people that necessarily would stand back and think WTF, but I don't know that I always said it. So at some point I lost the filter of where I would stand back and look and go, eh. But I, then I started saying it out loud, I think. And I think that, I, I don't know when you get comfortable in your skin, but I have to believe it was sometime in my 20s after I was married that I thought, you know, I'm going to say what I'm going to say. And I don't care what any of these people think or do. Or 
I, I didn't have to wait till I was 40. There's a lot of women that I'm hearing that are waiting until they're in their forties. I'm like, I've been like that forever. <laughs> I don't think I necessarily was like that as a teenager necessarily, but I think at some point you realize that. And I remember being 19 or 20 and thinking, this may not be the path. I think I was engaged to somebody else shortly after that. And I thought, this may not be the path that I want to take. Here's your ring back. I'm done with this shit. Wow. That's a huge decision to, to understand and recognize so early on. Yeah. But I don't know how you get there. You know, I, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of young people making a lot of decisions and I'm kind of watching now that I've got 21 and 18 year olds, I'm kind of watching them navigate those waters and because I can be so bossy, I'm trying to like stand down on the whole issue and say, is that really what you want to do? You know what I mean? And Oh yeah. I mean, we were at lunch today with my son and his girlfriend and I'm like, Oh, you know, these, these young people are graduating from college and going off to their careers and like, okay. Is that really what you're doing? And how are you going to make that happen? And, you know, trying not to, I, I do not want them in family business with us unless that's something they really wanted to do. And I looked at her today and I said, do you really think that that's something you'll want to do at some point? And she goes, Oh yeah. hadn't heard that coming. And it's interesting to hear them start verbalizing some of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And that shows that if they see potential in that, you know, that you've obviously set that example. Yeah. And it's weird because I've got one child that does not want to be in real estate, but yet already seeing the value of the real estate, uh, some of the things in real estate that she does like, oh yeah, mom, I'm going to need to own some Airbnbs when I'm an adult. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. Yes, you own some uh, some themed Airbnbs, is that right? I yes, yes, we do. Yes, we're doing some crazy shit. I love it. Talk and a little about those. I don't. Well, and it's weird because, um, and I don't even know how we got to that point because, uh, so several years ago, I was remodeling a home that I fully intended for our son to move in. It was on campus like a block off campus. It was my husband's first house. My father-in-law built it in 1957. And it was a house that I've always wanted to remodel. I just hadn't done it yet. Well, he's getting ready to be in college. And I thought, well, I'm going to remodel that house. He's probably going to go to school here next year. He hasn't really made the decision to remodel it. Fix it up. And I had like this gap in time. I think it was from, I think we finished the project in sometime in like mid-December. And I had until he, I told him he couldn't move in until July because I was waiting till after the 4th of July because I didn't want this 18 year old kid to, or 19 year old kid to move over there and have a, have a rager <laughs> move there after 4th of July. But, and so I had this gap of time and I told my husband, go get some of that furniture from the office and let's go stage that house and let's use it as Airbnb. And he's like, that's a horrible idea. Leave it vacant. And I'm like, leave it vacant for like seven months. No. Take the furniture over there. I don't even care what you think about this. We're going to try this. So I did. And I pretty quickly, he realized that, oh yeah, this could actually be a thing. Well then, you know, as stuff started coming up and turning over and his dad was getting further ill. And there are a couple of properties that his dad had that had never been upgraded. Then, you know, COVID happens. And I'm like, that property over there, that lady just moved out of it. It's completely vacant. It needs to be upgraded take your son over there and teach him how to remodel the house. I thought, who knows what's going to happen with all this mess. Just go do something. Get out of my hair. Get out <laughs> of my house. Yes. Go do something in the fresh air. Teach him how to remodel and paint a house and rehab it and from top to bottom. So they did do that. And then we got real busy. And I was like, oh God, what did I do to myself? So I'm constantly like pulling him off. I need you to go show this house. <laughs> and they're like, but I'm in the middle of painting and I'm a mess. I'm like, I don't even care. So anyway, we're crazy, you know, and maybe I just like that we're crazy and we just do what we have to do to get stuff done. So then we started doing some theme stuff. My, my, my husband was like, okay, we're going to do this one all of you because it's on campus. I'm like, that's a good idea. So then I accidentally one day I'm driving to show houses in Edmond and this lady posts this thing and I, it looks, she had bought stuff from an auction, but it looked like a whole restaurant full of OU paraphernalia. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'll be at Nichols Hills at your house to pick that up here shortly. So we did that house all over OU. And my mother-in-law is just 
we've got it to where it's cash flowing so much money for her now and she just loves it so then you know talk about telling the mouth you tell you get an 88 year old where she's cash flowing a whole bunch and she's telling everybody yeah so then, so then we had another one we put another one of ours online and then we had a couple and then we did another one for my mother-in-law we did that one all rock and roll because in the meantime my husband's aunt had passed she had all this elvis stuff so i call her son her our cousin i'm like i need all the elvis crap and he's like what I'm like pull it out of the safety deposit box i need all the elvis crap and so we did that one rock and roll and that's gone over big. And then my husband wanted to do a Star Wars themed one, which has gone over real big. And so we're doing a Marvel one, you know, we're just doing all these different things. And we've got a lake house one that we're working on that I'm, um, my, uh, cleaning lady was, we had a tenant that moved during COVID and it was just a mess to clean out. But in their garage, we found all this Indian artwork. And this Cherokee artist had just recently passed away. So now I'm getting one ready that has all this amazing Indian artwork down at the lake. Right wow. Now, middle of Chickasaw country. So that's going to be a fun one. So we just got lots of different things that we're doing. And now I've gotten my, I think, you know, you're an older sibling. So we've got, my husband has lost two of his brothers. And so we've got one older sibling left. And um you know, trying to counsel them into making good money moves. And they're a decade older than us too. And, you know, they moved from out West and, you know, had an opportunity because of the property values being so high out there to just do some different things with their money and, you know, retire out here. So they've done that recently. So I'm kind of mentoring her, my sister-in-law and brother-in-law into the business a little bit just on the, you know, property ownership side, I just felt they hadn't always been the best landlords or knew how to work their property to kind of maximize the values on it and stuff. So we've been doing some of that. The kids are getting old enough. Her kids are all adults and mine for all practical purposes are adults. And, you know, there's a lot to be learned from all of that. And I don't think that any of those are life, bad life lessons for them, especially when you think about, um, and I, I think that people don't understand about multiple streams of income and understanding what kind of safety net that builds for people to have multiple business ventures, be it whether it's investments or other businesses that they're invested in or the businesses that they're running. They don't have to be just committed and have one thing going. I mean, I think if anything, I've taught all these relatives of mine is that, you know, you can have five or six different things going and, you know, have all these different streams of income and it's okay to do that. And it's okay to make more money and it's okay to keep tweaking that. And it's okay to fail and it's okay to learn, you know what I mean? Just keep being better and doing things better every year. You know what I mean? And failure is again, part of the process. Oh, a hundred percent teaching, but teaching not only your kids, but an 88 year old elderly woman that they too can have that power of mailbox money is, is huge. I, and you know, it's interesting. My mother-in-law is such a strong woman, but because she was born in 1933, I don't think she was necessarily ever given permission. And it wasn't like my father-in-law was like an amazing, amazing man, but she was never given permission to kind of be the business owner that she or she didn't think she could. So when given that, I mean, she's just like, yeah, I would do whatever, make my money. <laughs> and I'm like, don't worry. I will granny. I got it handled. <laughs> like we got you granny and we're going to make you some money. Yep. Hell yeah. That's what it's about. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, but she gives me permission to do it and not all parents will even give their middle-aged children permission to do that. I think, um, you know, when you're raised kind of, and I was posting about this the other day, when you're raised in this box and you don't know that there's like this whole other world outside your box and kind of a perfect example of that happened, Amy, honestly, when we were in our twenties and we told both of our parents that we we're going to be realtors and both sets of parents said that is 
the most horrible idea of being self-employed is like the worst idea that you've ever had. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I get it. They're they're They were very afraid of failure and they were used to, you know, you work for a company until you're ready to retire and they give you this nice little retirement package. And then you say, you know, and my dad went off and created a whole nother business because he was retired early. I, but I don't think he ever loved it, but he was a really good mentor on the, the rental property side of things. He was always willing to jump in, uh, and be a landlord and own property and understand that that was a great second income. And then I just took his investments and kind of ran with it. Yeah. So I, it sounds like we grew up in exactly the same time because I was so, it was business ownership was something so foreign to me. I went to school, got my nursing degree. I'm a registered nurse, still hold that license, but um, yeah, stepping into business ownership was something that was so foreign to me. And I'm so glad that women like you have set an example of leadership that Yes, this is for you. This is for you too. This is for women. This is for men. This is for young. This is for old. This is available to anybody willing to take the chance and risk failure. Well, and it's a little bit about um, being passionate about something that you're doing. I have a friend that set up a new business at our shopping center recently, and we went over there the other day for her grand opening. And I think the thing that I left her with was that I just said, I am so proud of you. And I mean, she's a little bit younger, but we've been friends for a long time since I sold her first house years ago. And she said to me, I said, I'm so proud of you. You have now become the business owner that I always knew you were. Cause I could see that in her personality. Like this woman was dissatisfied working for people since the beginning of time. And she's such a strong leader and you know, she's just at that point in her life that the timing was right. Her husband is a great supporter. And he was like, do it. No, do it. And she had given him enough material to realize that his box of where you should be um, actually kind of blew up. You know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. she's made him realize that, listen, I can make this happen. Just give me the chance. Yeah. That sometimes I think as women we're raised or we think that we don't have permission to do that and it's just not true it's it's not true but you know I think you have to have a supporter you have to have a cheerleader so if you don't have that it's a lot harder to make those decisions or feel like um really confident in your decisions too yeah and it sounds like you've been the cheerleader for for many women well I like to think I am um, I think I'm so sorry. I love dogs. Got to love mine, especially. Um, but I think that I have been since the very beginning, although I think uh, about probably about five or six years ago, some of my friends dragged me into some national type of speaking engagements and doing some stuff on our, with our stuff on a national level. And then I started doing some stuff with the national association of realtors and, you know, the California association of realtors has a women's group called women up and just kind of pushing that whole issue. So, I mean, just kind of getting involved with those women's groups and realizing I, I, again, I'm kind of tunnel vision sometimes. And I think there was a lot of time where I was focused on my little people while they were little. I wanted to office at home and be in my own bubble. I don't like working in office sometimes because there's 50 distractions and everybody comes into your office and they've got 50 questions. You don't realize how like much time that takes out of your day. So there's, you know, good and bad to being in offices. And I've always realized that. Yeah. And it was kind of funny because it was several years ago, I had pulled my assistant out of an office set up and we had moved to this new company and she's like, I'm getting so much more done. I was like, yeah, that's because we're not being used as the broker to answer every question of every single realtor that walks in this office. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Putting those people in place underneath you so that you can rise to the next level of working on the business yeah. Yeah. Is, is a struggle sometimes. Oh, it, for sure is. And it's more of a struggle for those of us who are type A personalities and want to control everything. 
Yeah. Yeah. Have you been able to, to let go of some of that? What's your best advice for those of us who do struggle with that kind of letting go and delegating? I have, I have, I think you can find the, you're not going to be good at everything. So if there's, I think what I learned pretty early on looking at my calendar, if you see those tasks and I kind of live and die by my calendar, honestly, if it's not on my Google calendar, it just doesn't even exist to me. So if you kind of see those tasks that you're putting off and off and off, I identified those and those are the ones that I started passing off and saying, Mm -hmm. you know what? I don't really want to do that. Guess what? I've been postponing that and it needs to get done. So guess what? It needs to go to somebody else to get it done. And so that was, that would probably be my best because I am, I struggle with the fact that I can get it done faster. I can get it done sooner and I can get it done better. So there are certain things I will not pass off. I think as I've been mentoring more people into this business, I've learned to slow down and realize that I have to teach in order to get them on the level. And one employee that worked for me for like seven years before she went on on her own in the last few years, she said, you know, one of the best things that you made me do was do this and do it, learn to do it fast and to do it accurately. And now I can do it, but I only learned it really good because you force fed me and like out of a fire hose, you said, here it is now drink it all real fast. Yep. (laughs) And I don't care how you get it done. You just have to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of like the mama bird. Here you are. Exit the nest. Yeah. And to me, that's been super helpful, but people have to want to learn. And I, I struggle with the fact that there's a bunch that say they want to learn and do stuff. Um, but in actuality, the reality of our business is tough and a large percentage of them aren't willing to drink out of the firehouse. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. So (sighs) I just had a question that I was going to ask and then I just lost it. No worries. Sorry. (laughs) You're good. It's a lot. I'm a lot. (laughs) Oh, I love that you said you're a lot. Like, have you been described as a lot your whole life? I probably by my husband all the time. I think early on when we were young, he looked at me and he was like, are you done? And I was like, Oh, you're the man for me. <laughs> Walk back. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Strong women leaders. We need someone who will, you know, bump yeah. just a little bit with us. Yeah. It's like, are you done? And I'm like, oh yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> it means a lot to have a partner that gets you and yeah. gets that you're a lot and that's okay. It sounds like you realized and accepted that you were a lot in your early twenties. That's much sooner than most of us realize. So weird too, to think about it. I guess you get a whole, you know, 20 years of perspective plus on it and you go, yeah, that's weird that I did figure that out early, but I guess that's what allows you to succeed faster too. You know what I mean? Is if you accept what you are and know what you are and do things to your strength and don't get put in a box that you realize that there's like all these opportunities that you're missing if you don't. Um, And that's probably what I would have missed if I didn't just think bigger and bigger and bigger all the time, you know, there would have been things and opportunities, you know, because there are things that people get every day that come across their desk or their text or their email and they go, no, 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 no. Well, do you really know what you're saying no to? I mean, are your ears open and are you using, are you thinking with your head? Or are you thinking with your heart? Or do you just like to say no to everything? <laughs> I mean, and not saying, not that saying no is bad because to, in my world, I say no a lot, but no doesn't always mean no, it can be not now, mm-hmm. or that's not the right move for me right now. So when I realized that about people and about myself and that I was able to somehow discern what the right things were to say yes to, or I made a decision that this is what we're doing. And I didn't let 
somebody tell me that I didn't have enough money, that um, that was too much work, um, that I wasn't going to be successful, that I just ignored all the outside influences. That's probably been my gift of everything was that I just ignored what everybody said and just, you know, plowed forward and didn't care what anybody said. My husband's saying, no, no Airbnb is I'm not bringing furniture over there. I'm like, yes, you are. Just do it now. Because I had already decided that's what we we're doing. And I didn't care. What a gift to be able to decide. I found I've learned so much recently that, that that is that's a huge struggle for people to just make a decision, whether it be about, I mean, at, at Target, there is an entire aisle of just tied laundry soap, just for tied, the whole aisle. There's a whole nother aisle for other. If we have that many choices in our laundry soap, how are we supposed to make a choice in our lives? The, the fact that you can decide and go with something. And if you fail, you fail. But if you don't, you never know. And that that's such a gift to have. That might be why I hate shopping. And I refuse to go to the store. That might be why I hate shopping. And yeah. so when online shopping became a thing, I'm like, oh my God, I've been waiting for you forever. Just bring it to the house. Yes, COVID hits and you're like, hold on, this is my time. Yeah. <laughs> this was made for me. I'm supposed to be doing everything online. Yeah. I love it. So with there being 7,000 ish realtors in, in the state that are in the Metro that people can do business with, what makes EXP Realty different? Uh, and I don't even know that it's my company that's different because there are a million different real estate companies. I think I'm pretty unique in that I can help people get to what they want. So I go out to their house and I see what we're dealing with. And I say, well, do you want to do this or do you want to do that? This is how much money you make this way. This is how much money you make this way. What do you want to do? And so maybe me forcing them to make decisions for people that are harder to make decisions or like I walked through a house and more yesterday and I said, okay, you need to do this, 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 and this, and then we can go live on the market next week. And so my clients usually walk out of an appointment with me knowing exactly what they need to do. They know exactly how much time they have to give me to get the photographer there to take pictures of their house and then we can move forward. So I think even like um, with Kelly and them, you know, they just needed somebody to lay out the path to how it was to buy and sell a house all at once. And mm -hmm. it's not the easiest thing, but it can be done. So just kind of creating a plan for people and giving them free will where they're making their own decisions about what they're going to do and not going to do. Uh, empowering them. I, I find that I have to empower people a lot. Um, and I don't know if it is that they think they don't have choices or they just don't know what their choices are. So I kind of lay those things out for them and then they can make good financial decisions because we really are, at least in my business, are a fiduciary. I mean, uh, people's real estate is typically their biggest investment lifetime wise. So, you know, yeah. I feel a lot of um, there's a lot of weight that's being carried in that carried in that. So for people to be able to make good financial decisions about what they're doing with their real estate is important to me. The market yeah. right now has been crazy. And, you know, with a bunch of other realtors in there, I don't really, like I said before, I don't, I don't care how many realtors they kind of come and go. I'm not worried about other people. I'm worried about our people and that they're successful, but I don't really worry about everybody, what everybody else is doing or what the market's doing or what the rates are. I mean, it doesn't matter because people still are going to have to buy and sell real estate. People are going to pass. People are going to lose spouses. People are going to have different points in their life that they want to get near their kids. I mean, there's all these different reasons why people buy and sell. And it's usually stuff that's really complicated and um, sometimes uh, heart crushing. And I mean, there's been a lot of death and, you know, I'm usually one of the first people in the door. We're dealing with people's emotions and, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot most days. And for some reason in my gut, I'm able to deal with that. And I think if you're a little bit more um, sensitive, you might not live in my business and you have to be able to set the emotional part of what's going on with people aside and get them to focus on what they need to do to improve their life, let them move on. Um, and, and sometimes my services aren't what's good for them. And I'll tell them that, you know, you have to be afraid to not say the hard things. 
Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm kind of the truth teller a lot of times for folks and they don't necessarily always like me for that. And I don't really care. It's what we need. <laughs> we need that. That's, it sounds like you're a source of just strength and presence for these people in these times that are so confusing and presenting them with, here are the options. Here's what this looks like and giving them that path as their guide, because they have never, you know, how many houses do most people buy and sell? Not that many, you know, 23 years of experience can really bring something to the table. But when you're giving people their power back, let's just say they've lost a spouse. They've had a house burned down. I mean, I have a, a lady in my sphere right now that this, and it's hard to move on and it's hard to see through all the fog that that puts in your way. It's hard to get out of bed sometimes when these devastating nightmarish things have happened to you all at once. And I mean, I'm like, get out of bed. You have to make a decision. Let's do something. And they're like, I don't know where to start. I don't know where to begin. I'm like, you have a house that needs to be rebuilt. I need you to tell me if you're going to rebuild that house. And, oh, yes, I want to live back up there. Okay, well, I need you to do one thing every day that makes it more possible for you to get there. It's going to take a while for us to do this, but I need you to drag your ass out of bed. And so sometimes I'm just that, like, that friend that people need to hear from. I was following up with a client today that has a big plumbing emergency at her house. I'm like, okay, um, what did they do? What did they decide? Oh, it's concrete in your sewer line. That's great. Lovely. So what are they doing to fix it? Were they able to clear it or no, they need to jackhammer up my floor. Oh, great. That's wonderful. Okay. So how are you going to get that flooring back? Well, I'm going to have to replace the whole house floor with the flooring. And uh, no, you're not. That, that person that you just bought that house from six months ago probably knows where they got that flooring from. We don't need to be spending a bazillion dollars when we need to spend $2,000. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just trying to help guide people to make it's all about making good decisions and good financial decisions where they think oh this is going to be a ten thousand dollar project no 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 no. it's a two thousand dollar project yeah yeah i mean so wendy foreman uh realtor mom wife counselor best friend motivator kick your ass or get your ass up and do something pretty much in a nutshell <laughs> Most days I have to get up and have my coffee first. One realtor called this morning. She's like, have you had your coffee yet? I'm like, I'm in the middle of caffeinating. What is it, Tara? <laughs> Give me the 50% version till I finish this cup. <laughs> what do you have for me this early in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Well, uh, anything else you'd like your your listeners, your people to know about Wendy? We didn't even really get into your into your nonprofit or philanthropic work or anything like that yet. Yeah, well, yeah, that's just the stuff, the good stuff on the side. That's why you get out of bed and help people some days. So, yeah, yeah. So we can but, make a, an impact on our own families and our community. Well, that or our, or our bigger world as a whole, you know what I mean? Yeah. One person at a time, mm-hmm. kicking them out of bed, yeah. <laughs> make those decisions. Come on. Some days that's what it takes. Some days that's what it takes. <laughs> well, I, for one, appreciate your queenful leadership in our state and community and to your people. And one of my sister was a client of yours and they are very happy in their home. And it did. I, I'm going to say right here in front of God, the public and everybody that bitch needed to make a decision. <laughs> well, clearly they were able to, so they were obviously able to, with your help, they, were, so they were terrified, but that's okay. They were terrified, but you know what? Now my husband and I have like seriously like FOMO about their beautiful property and all that land they got and the building and oh man, it's great. It's a beautiful place. So thank you for that. Thank you for working with my family and thank you for working in our state. Wendy Foreman, tell our listeners, your listeners, how they can find you. Well, I'm on Facebook and I think you're going to post the links. But um, I'm on Facebook, so I've got, uh, we've got 405homevalues.net, um, and you can always reach out to me on my cell phone, 405-473-6832. I am one of those people that actually answers phone and text. Hey, so you heard one it right of my here. superpowers, I answer my phone. A real estate agent that will answer her phone. Give her a call, visit 405house.net, or find her, Wendy 
Anderton Foreman on Facebook. Thank you so much for joining us, Wendy. We appreciate your queenful leadership and just keep doing what you're doing. Well, thank you for influencing me. Absolutely.